Hello and welcome back. So today we're going to start with um, an, the next war that we need to look at. Now this is the Korean War. Um, it's very different from everything we've seen before, even what we saw on Friday, which was the revolution in China, because it's the first example that we look at um, that we call a proxy war. Now that is something where America and the USSR both get involved in a conflict that isn't directly between themselves. So they're both helping somebody else out. Um, and by doing so, they are technically fighting against each other, but they're not stating to the world we're at war with each other. So it's a little bit complicated. Um, now, I'm gonna start by just briefly talking about Korea. So this is Korea, um, and to this day, it's still split into North and South. Um, in 1910, Japan, who is over here on the map that we, that we can't see, Japan invade and occupy Korea. And they're there until the end of the Second World War. So about 35 years, they occupy Korea, they run it. At the end of the war, just like in Europe, Korea was liberated from the Japanese. So when Japan fall, where they, when they give up in the war, they withdraw, they surrender. Um, Korea is liberated. Now, in the same way that's happened in Europe, they're liberated by the Soviet forces in the north and by the American troops in the south. So in the north, you have Soviet soldiers. In the south, you have American soldiers. They both agree to split it along this line. Now, this line here is called the 38th parallel. And this is a line that runs all around the globe. Um, and if you have a globe, if you see a map, you'll see there are lines that run across them. They're not real lines. They don't exist. They are just lines that, you know, geographers drew on the world many, many years ago as, as some kind of method of um, navigation and discussing where things are, things like that. It's an imaginary line across the world. And it just so happens that this line runs through the middle of Korea. So it made sense for them to say, for the moment, temporarily, let's split the country along this line. We will take control of the South. You can take control of the North and we'll just wait until we can organize proper elections and then we'll leave and Korea can look after themselves. So they made a promise that they would wait until free elections happened and then Korea could be united again and America and Russia would leave. Now, the UN comes in, the United Nations, and tries to organise these elections. However, the Soviets don't let them into North Korea, and suddenly they realise that the Soviets have already established a communist government in the North, led by a man named Kim, Kim Il-sung, um, who is communist, who is influenced by Stalin. So the Russians, the USSR, have gone back on their promise and North Korea has become communist. South Korea have elections led by the UN and they elect a man called Sing Man Ri um, who leads an anti-communist democratic government in the South. So we now have two separate governments. This one influenced by America and the West and democracy. This one influenced by um, the Soviet Union, communist. It's kind of okay um, until Stalin starts to encourage North Korea to have small attacks along the border into South Korea. And South Korea, when China fall to communism in 1949, get very, very worried. They feel very vulnerable. And you can see why. If this whole country and this whole country is communist, they are very much out on a limb here on their own and there is a very high chance that they would also be forced to fall to communism. Lots of strong armies, strong presence, very very near them and no real support base. So South Korea become increasingly vulnerable. America at the same time are really worried about this. They have very publicly stated their commitment to containing communism. They very much failed in containing communism in China. China fell to communism, shows the failure of the Truman Doctrine. With the Truman Doctrine in mind, they really feel a pressure and a desire to try and protect South Korea and stop it from equally falling to communism as China and North Korea has done. So the Soviets begin to provide equipment and military aid to North Korea. China is very enthusiastic about this fight and 
last lesson on Friday, we we read and we wrote down that China actually feel quite betrayed by the Soviet Union because China put forces, ground troops, soldiers into North Korea to help push into the South Korea, whereas the USSR only put weapons and military aid. They don't put soldiers themselves, which does show us Stalin is hesitant at committing to a full out war against America. He doesn't he's he's still worried about the power of America. He doesn't feel quite as confident to put soldiers on the ground. Um, but to summarize by this point, North Korea and China are both communist. They have quite a strong presence in terms of military, um, a military force, and they are starting to have small attacks over the border into South Korea. And we're about to see the start of the conflict. So, the first thing that happens is map four. So, if you look at map four, you'll see in your lesson that one of your tasks is to actually put these maps in order and match them up with these boxes. So I'm gonna summarize these boxes for you and I'm gonna show you which map that they correlate to so we can talk through what happens. And then later when you get on with this yourself, you'll need to reflect, remember, work it out, or even re-listen, re re-watch this to, to be able to do the task. China and North Korea, remember 38th parallel is here. Now, they, push with this quite strong military presence into South Korea and they very very quickly overwhelm them and push them all the way to this very small corner. So South Korean government, South Korea troops are stuck in this very small section and for the North, for communism, this looks really successful. Look at how much they've taken over, they've pushed down, down, down and they've almost won, almost instantly. South Korea appealed to the United Nations um, who have a vote and they decide, they agree that North Korea is the aggressor and that South Korea deserves some support. So they send in an army and that army is led by a man called General MacArthur. He's an American. When General MacArthur lands in um, Korea, they very quickly push all the way back. So we're going to map three. So we've First of all, had this happen, suddenly a coalition force of United Nations soldiers led by a very successful American general, and we see them overwhelm the communists, and they push all the way back up here. Now, at this point, um, the UN forces led by General MacArthur, Truman wants them to stop, essentially. He says, you've, you know, you've done what you needed to do, calm down, stop. We don't want to aggravate China, but General MacArthur, who is leading the troops, he ignores that advice and he keeps pushing and he pushes all the way to the Yalu River. And that's where China um, make a statement to say you need to stop. And they start to amass ground troops all around the border to protect themselves. OK, so it's looking more and more likely that quite a large scale war might happen. Those troops come in. Truman replaces MacArthur with a new general and the South Korean troops are pushed back again down to here and the Chinese army help the North Koreans push them back to this point. So we've gone here first of all, then we've pushed all the way back, then we've replaced our general um, because we don't want full scale war. It shows a hesitation from Truman And that happens. Now, finally, the UN forces push back again. And after three years of war, we end up, if you notice, exactly where we started. But on the 38th parallel, nothing's really shifted. So it reaches a stalemate. We're back at the 38th parallel and nobody's made any significant gains whatsoever. So it's a bit of a disaster, really. On the one hand, Truman was able to protect South Korea. They contained communism. They didn't allow it to spread any further. They also show that they did not want to risk full military intervention in the same way that the USSR show they don't want to risk full military intervention by putting soldiers in. So we're seeing hesitation on behalf of our two superpowers. Neither one wants full scale war. And we're seeing that Truman was able 
to contain communism, okay? And that's that's it, really. That's pretty much it for the Korean War. In terms of um, a couple of really important things we need to take away, um, this is something which will become even more important in tomorrow's lesson when we look at Vietnam. But what I want you to remember is when we looked at this map and I said China was communist, North Korea was communist, and that those two factors make it very likely that South Korea is going to fall to communism. Now, if you look at this picture, and if you imagine that this domino is China, this domino is North Korea, and this domino is South Korea, and if I push the first one back, what happens? Well, we all know what happens, and in my PowerPoint, I've got a video for you to have a look at, but one will fall into the other, which will fall into the other, and it will keep on going. Now, this becomes known as the domino theory, the idea that if one country falls, another will fall, and another will fall, and another will fall, and it becomes something that the Americans, Truman, are really, really, really worried about. This idea that we have a situation, this has fallen, it will push into this one and it will push into this one, which will then push and push and push. And my extension for you today is thinking about this at the moment. Um, let me see if I can get a pen. Yep. So Russia is communist. China is now communist. North Korea, I've just highlighted, is communist. Um, Vietnam, we're going to get to in a minute tomorrow, but Vietnam has some issues with communism okay now why do you think looking at this situation america might suddenly be quite concerned about the domino effect what are the countries they're worried about falling we have quite a lot of asia has influences or surrounding countries russia is obviously huge the ussr the biggest country in the world I know it's difficult to imagine when we look at a flat map, but remember that these countries directly link back round here. Um, and I don't know if any of you know what's coming, but at some point we have an issue with Cuba and communism. So do we see why they are so concerned about these countries, which, which are seemingly so far away from them? But it's just this idea that when one thing happens, it will push into another and another and another and another. And suddenly we have a situation where too much of the world is communist. OK, and that's what we call the domino theory. So what I'd like you to do is to stop listening to me rambling on now. I've now finished. Um, lucky you. And go to the PowerPoint, go through it, work through it you know, at your own pace and see how much you can get done. Try and work it out for yourself. Um, hopefully I've explained that so it makes sense um, and have fun.